Joining me right now is Jose Shorty Torres, the champ champ, Titan FC, flyweight and bantamweight champion. Welcome to Kumite Radio. Oh, it's a pleasure, man. Thank you for having me on. Now, I wanted to first talk about, you know, your title defense at uh, Titan FC 48. Um, very impressive, you know, with your precision punching. And you called your shot. You said you were going to finish him in the first round. You did what you did. It, when you look back now, you know, it's been a couple of days. How do you assess your performance? Oh, man, you know, it's it was exactly as I predicted, which is crazy because it never, ever happens that way. <laughs> you know, uh, for me, I, my goal is to, you know, uh, fight the guy, hopefully beat him in the first round and just be as healthy as possible just in case something pops up last minute. And for me, you know, this is the first time, at least in three fights, that I haven't been injured. My last two fights, you know, I broke my hand, tore my MCL. And the last one, I took so many calf kicks and stitches that I had to, again, deny six UFC fights. So for me, it's like, wow, I'm healthy. I don't know what to do now. You know, like I'm so used to just being injured and taking time off. Now I'm healthy. I'm even, you know, I worked out the day after and I'm just, uh, you know, I'm just happy that I can keep on training and, you know, just be ready for whatever's next. You, uh, you pay tribute to your father in this fight. How does it feel to make your father proud because you know every kid's dream part of their dream is to make their parents proud of them yeah you know sadly i didn't get to do the homage that i wanted to do uh my my sponsored fight gear was supposed to come out in purple and black but my gear actually never made it to the event it just you know bad shipping details and it just never happened but i mean my dad knew that the fight was dedicated to him and uh you know my dad wanted two things in life he wanted to be a fighter and he wanted to be a painter and or at least a very very good artist and well he had two kids. One of them's a very good artist and one of them's a very good fighter. So, you know, I wanted to play tribute to him and show that I know you gave me a very, very rough childhood, but, you know, you gave me a better life than what you had. So job well done. And, you know, in this fight, you know, I got the knockout. I know he was crying after the fight and very, very happy and very ecstatic about it. But it's really cool to have just both my parents by the, you know, by my side and know that all the time and hours that they spent in the me of, you know, taking me to martial arts and, and really just keeping me focused. And mainly when I was a bad kid when I was younger, it's, you know, it's all paid off. But I saw that you guys were wearing the hats. The colors of the hats were matching, yeah. right? Yeah, everything worked out well. Again, my, my brother's uh my brother is like my biggest fan, so he's a big fan boy. So he's like, You're coming on purple and black. I'm making purple and black hats, I'm making it for everybody. We're all done. I was like, Okay, cool, whatever you want, man. So, you know, it worked out again really, really well. And uh yeah, I'm just happy that again everyone was just, you know, smiling after the fight. You know, I'm not injured, I'm not beat up, we're not at the hospital. I'm not bleeding. I'm not broken. So, uh, you know, again, we're able to just enjoy ourselves. And, you know, I'm back home in Chicago for a week and join time with my family. And, uh, you know, I, I travel so much, you know, so it's nice to be able to just settle down, enjoy a fat week, and, uh, you know, just spend time with my family and friends. Yeah. Hashtag fat week. I guess you got to make hashtag, that now. <laughs> hashtag Tim Monk Cheeks. That's, that's pretty much what I got right now. <laughs> um, you talked about, you know, you've been very open about your father, you know, being in that, you know, in the street life. Now, when you were growing up, was that, was the street life something that you were like very, you know, standoffish about or were you kind of, uh, kind of lured into it a little bit and how did you keep yourself away from that? Um, you know, for me, I, I honestly had the two, I wouldn't say worst role models, but very bad role models, which were my brother and my father. You know, my mother was the, the educated one in the family. She had a proper job and, you know, she did everything appropriately, but um, she's the one that kept me in school. My brother and father were all about the gang life. They were all about drugs and money. And naturally, you know, as a boy growing up, you look up to your big brother, you look up to your father. So I'm like, oh, I'm going to be just like them. Or this is cool. That's not, you know, I got to do this stuff. I'm, I'm, I'm a gangster. I'm a real G. Like I got to, I got to do this stuff. And it's crazy because, you know, my father at the time was in his thirties. My brother's slowly in his teens and into his twenties. And they would literally stop me right before I started doing stuff and go, don't be like us. No, 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 you do this route. Be like mom, you know, go to school, do that. And even though I still had to do some of the stuff that my family did, um, they got me out at really pretty much the right time and, and kept me out of the streets. I mean, I, I had to do my fair share of really dumb stuff, but again, it, it made me tough and it made me the person I am today. Do you think that the media kind of promotes that too much? You know, like it's something that is luxurious, something that is, you know, like, pleasing for the person to be a gangster yeah man actually i was talking about that to to another friend of mine who graduated high school with me today and was like man 
it's crazy because the people talking about that these days are, you know, the little whatevers, you know, the freshman year rappers, stuff like that. You know, they did none of it, but they're <laughs> posing and the kids are just eating it all up. And they think that's, you know, that's the way you're supposed to do it. Doesn't matter what nationality, white, Asian, Latino, black, like they just feel like you're supposed to be doing the drugs. You're supposed to be calling women this, uh, doing that. And it's like, why? You know, like I, given, you know, I, I was that, that usual trend where at least back in my day, 90s and early 2000s, where I'm wearing the shirt that doesn't fit me. It's all the way down to my knees. I'm wearing big chains for no apparent reason. I'm wearing do-rags, but I have no, you know, crazy hair. And, uh, you know, I'm doing really, really dumb stuff. And I, you know, become an adult. And I'm like, man, I would have slapped the hell out of myself if I would have saw them. You know, it's it's really crazy. But, yeah, it, everything's social media. Everything's, you know, on, on music these days. And it's it's baffling that. You know, all these kids are eating it up. I don't know why that's become such a huge trend, but I mean, you look back in the day, you know, the class clown is usually the the cool guy in class for some reason, but he's not the smartest. He's not the, you know, and for me, I was the class clown and I really had to struggle with just to go to school because I really had to catch up. And for me, I, I wish I would have been the nerd. I wish I would have been the geek. I wish I could have done all these things, but, you know, I was able to do it later on in my life. And because of that, I've been able to be so successful. Yeah, I think a lot of people when they grow up and realize that, hey, when you when you actually went to school, you wanted to be the nerd because you wanted to be the Mark Zuckerberg or, you know, those types yeah. of you know people, right? Yeah, I mean, well, everyone in my neighborhood, you know, we're all Latinos, so everyone's a handyman. Everyone's either cutting grass or doing plumbing or doing construction. And, hey, man, I'm not doubting any of those jobs, and we always need people to do that. But everyone is doing it, you know. But I know guys that were just super talented, mainly in sports, and they just weren't smart. You know, they just never tried. They were the jocks having other people do their homework, which, hey, man, you know, again, I was able to pay a tribute to that because I had people do my homework, too. But by the time I go, you know, it's either military, it's working at McDonald's, or I try to go to school. And I really put 100% full effort when I went to junior college because I did so well and I did so well in wrestling as well. I ended up getting a full scholarship. And I had, I, you know, I busted my balls just to get everything done. And it really, it really was, was difficult. But I know if I would have been – you know, the, the class nerd, it would have been so much easier. Yeah, for sure. Now, growing up in Chicago, you know, Chicago is a big sports town. Who was, who was the, you know, like your sports hero growing up? You know, for me, I, I don't know if I have sports hero, at least from Chicago. I know my father was Walter Payton, Michael Jordan, you know, all these, you know, legends in the making and stuff like that. But, you know, my dad used to make me watch boxing fights. Didn't matter if it was – big time boxing fights like Manny Pacquiao Mayweather or if it was like the little you know um the little Mexican shows where it's just the local guys going at it for some reason we always watched it and then we play fight between every single round the round was you know over we start fighting rounds about to start we start watching the fight you know so I was always into into fighting you know, I started martial arts I was four my biggest role model growing up was Manny Pacquiao mm-hmm. you know Manny Pacquiao started at 108 got his first belt at 112 and ended his career at 154 you know like the, the guy did spectacular things and he's never been the big guy in his, in, you know, in any fight. And for me, I was like, that, that's awesome. You know, I'm the small guy. I've always been the smallest guy. The only thing regular about me is the size of my head, you know? So I'm just like, this is, this is awesome. Like this is a small guy doing big things. If he can do it, why can't I? And so far, you know, I'm a two way class champion as an amateur. I fall between 125 and 155, the same thing as Manny Pacquiao. And yeah, you know, I wanted to be able to, to compare myself to some of the greats and so far I'm trying my best to do so and really paper wise show in my fights that, that I can, you know, hang with the best in the world. Before your last title fight, you know, a lot of guys pulled out. They didn't want to fight you. Yeah. Do you are you worried that you're gonna run out of opponents to fight? So, you know, my next level hopefully is the UFC. And the crazy thing was I I got called six times by the UFC and sadly, you know, just injuries happened, I couldn't take the fight. Uh, it's horrible timing. And then I got called for UFC Charlotte because some fights actually backed out. They need to make new fights happen. And they go, Shorty, you know, we like you a lot. We want you, but um, we can't sign you immediately. But here, we'll give you two opponents. You pick whichever one you want. I go, you know what? Uh, I really don't care. How about this? Uh, whichever one will fight me. Both those guys denied the fight. So it's like I'm either injured or UFC fighters don't want to fight me. So I was like, okay, well, I guess I got to fight for Titan. You know, I still have to make a, a living for myself, you know, and I don't get paid much through Titan. So I was like, all right, uh, let, let's fight the number two guy. I do believe 100% in the ranking system. So I go, oh, okay, I beat the champion. I'm the champ. Now let's beat the number one guy. I've already beat the number one guy. All right, cool. Number two, number three, number four, all of them denied the fight. So it's like, 
what what the hell? You know, like I need to fight someone. Well, Alberto Oriano was a guy to be just brave enough to accept the fight. You know, he saw the opportunity in the making and, you know, even though it didn't work out well for him, I commend him for doing that. It's the whole Apollo Rocky, you know, type of thing where Apollo just like, ah, oh, forget it. No one wants to fight me. I've already beaten the best. Let's just find some random local guy and see, you know, how it works out. UFC 225, June 9th. You're campaigning hard to get on that card. You know, you already told, you just told me that people denied you that are already in the UFC. They don't want to match up against you. If you could choose an opponent that is in the UFC, who would be an ideal opponent to make your debut against? See, the debut one is hard because, you know, obviously I want, I want to look good. I want to, I want to feel good. And I want to go against someone good enough. But I, I'm not saying I want an easy fight, but I definitely want it to be an appropriate fight, mm -hmm. you know, mainly for a UFC debut. But for me, with the way I've been moving up so fast in my career with 7 0, three title defenses, two belts, two different weight classes. And, uh, you know, I think the fun fight that fans really, really want to see is Tim Elliott. Mm -hmm. You know, Tim Elliott is a fantastic fighter. He's always exciting. I've trained and lived with the guy before in a training camp when he was getting ready for Demetrius Johnson. I was getting ready for one of his former, uh, former opponent, Pedro Nobre. And, I mean, we helped each other a lot. We even talked about fighting each other. We're like, dude, that'd be awesome just because of our fighting style. I never stopped pushing forward. And you never know what he's doing. Hell, he never even knows what he's doing. You know, it's just, it's crazy how him and I compare to each other all the time. And, you know, he's the former 10 FC champ at the flyweight division. I'm the current champ. It just was really, really cool just to see who would have been the real undisputed champion. You are on a crazy win streak, you know, going even back to your amateur days. How, you know, how do you stay grounded? Who or what keeps you in check? Ah, man, everyone. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm on a 32 fight win streak. But again, I never did this sport to be the best. I never did the sport to be a champion. I lost every single first fight. So I know how it is to lose. Mm -hmm. No, it's not fun at all, but it's a learning experience. And honestly, I'm kind of excited to finally get that next challenge to where, you know, I have to come back through adversity. And maybe it just doesn't happen. I don't get to win. I want to see how much better I come back after that. Because if I didn't lose my first fight in any of them, I never would have been, you know, a two-time world champ and then 32 fight win streak and all the record that I have now. So I'm excited to see what happens next. But for me, you know, I have a lot of coaches from all over the world and they always tell me when you get cocky, that's when you get knocked out. You know, you see the Cody Garbrandt, you see the Ronda Rousey, you see all these people that, that are great and they were humble and out of nowhere, they just start talking to smack. You want to young Jacek again was one of them. And out of nowhere, everyone's in the bandwagon until they lose. And then they just get smashed to the ground and, I don't want to be that guy. I want to be that guy. If, if, if I lose, I want people to still support me and go, that's the people's champ. That's the guy I still want to see fight, even if he loses. You know, I'm, again, I do this sport for fun. I don't do this sport to, to mock anyone, to bully anyone, or, or, or to be that guy that's always talking smack. My smack talk is, you know, in the cage. And I, I, I walk the walk instead of talk to talk. So I, you know, I just do my thing. And uh, I try to inspire more instead of, uh, you know, showing all this hate and, and being like the social media and all those guys out there. I'm going to make my prediction for your future. <laughs> Jory Torres versus Tim Elliott kicking off UFC 20, 225 pay-per-view portion. I think it's a perfect – I think the stars are going to align for you, Shorty. I think that's an amazing fight. He doesn't have a fight plan. I know he's definitely uh, calling out Henry Cejudo. But, you know, we, we don't know what's next. You know, a lot of people are saying that I might fight Ryan Benoit. You know, but I know he's recovering. I, I believe he's still recovering from a broken hand. I don't know if he's uh, fully recovered yet, but I don't see myself fighting anyone below the top 10. You know, my record, my accolades, everyone that just got signed to the UFC, that, that'd be a horrible fight for them to take against me just because it's it's a high caliber fight with a guy who technically doesn't have a ranking yet in the UFC. You know, it's it's a lose-lose for them, you know, but for the guys in the top 10, that's that's something to prove that they deserve to be up there. And for me, it's something to prove that I deserve to fight some of the best. If you could give a message to the division in the, you know, your division in the UFC, what would the message be? Ah, oh, man, the message. Let's see. If you're not, if you're not exciting, don't call me out. You know, I don't want to fight a Henry Cejudo who's going to lay and pray. I don't want to fight some of those guys that honestly don't deserve to be in the UFC. I deserve to fight guys like Tim Elliott, Joseph Benavidez, you know, Demetrius Johnson, those guys that are going out there, you know, for the finish. And for me, I've gotten three fights at flyweight division. I've knocked them all out. Now, do you want to be the next one to get knocked out? 
All right, Shorty, thank you for your time, man. I look forward to seeing you in the Octagon in Chicago, UFC 225. I appreciate it, man. Thank you for your time, and I can't wait till next time.